Boys and gents and welcome to CG Reaction and this is Napoleon's Masters Part 2 by the channel Epic History TV. I already had to do part 1 some time ago. You can check the you know end card or description for it. So this is part 2. In the first part we mostly saw you know honorary marshals who were just made marshals for political reason I guess. And in the end we did saw some of the marshals. Um, obviously Napoleon's marshal. Napoleon was first of all was a brilliant brilliant general a brilliant emperor after that uh, Napoleon basically brought back France after the French Revolution and he was no safe to be best in the world and yet he made France best of best in the world after that he, he was feared French were feared all around the world uh, his marshals are all general caliber people themselves uh, especially you know Marshal Dao. Uh, he was just brilliant. He kicked Russian army's ass uh, when you know Russians thought Napoleon is coming, but it was just uh, Dao with his small, small, you know, small part of the uh, his uh, French army, and he went against entire Russian army, and he kicked their asses. They ran in fear, while Napoleon was somewhere else doing something. I love that uh, Bernadotte was basically made marshal. I think he was, you know, uh, he was in relation to napoleon he married napoleon's you know i don't know something like that so he was in relation with napoleon so he was basically family he became swedish king afterwards so that is something uh marshal ney who was loyal to napoleon even at the waterloo same thing with uh, marshal grouchy uh, Grouchy basically was so loyal that in the end he didn't come to you know napoleon's uh, aid during the Battle of Waterloo, he just followed his orders, and people were, you know, uh, dumped on him because of that. Like, you know, Marshal Grouch is the reason why Napoleon lost. Man, he was following the orders. Come on, so there was that. I think the best uh, Marshal was Dawu. I'm pretty sure he's gonna be number one in the end of this uh, Napoleon's Marshal series. Uh, but yeah, it's just incredible. The you know. But, the, uh, Napoleon's martial are so incredible. Let's just say Epic History TV is making videos about them, separate videos about just Napoleon's martial. That's how great they were. So that was awesome. All right, let's watch this one. Terror belly, decus pacis. Terror in war. The way he said terror belly, like he was asking a question or something. Ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. In France, the title of marshal or maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. I love how Napoleon not just made marshals like this, but also he brought in, brought in the core system. He, he didn't invent it, but I'm pretty sure he was the first guy who properly implemented it at this large scale. And that, that was one of the main reasons why Napoleon was so dominant. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals. Now with expert be first. guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Porte, former Chief Historian of the French Army. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brun, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski and Jourdan. Before we begin, a big thanks to our video sponsor, Displate. For those who don't know, Displate make exceptional metal posters that allow you to decorate your home with unique collectible artwork that reflects your interests and passions. As you can see, Displates are shipped in secure and elegant packaging and can be put up in just 20 seconds using a sticker and magnet system, so no need for drilling or hooks. And a huge 37% off when you buy three or more. 
Yeah, people go to display.com for us the epic history TV and support the channel. Thanks again to Displate for sponsoring this video. Eighteen, Marshal Bernadotte. I can only say that Bernadotte let me down. I can accuse him of ingratitude, but not of treason. Yeah, that, that is true, though. You can't, you can't claim that he's a you know traitor, even though I kind of did when reacting to the Napoleon video. To me, it's like, man, come on. You should have helped him, but he was never with good term with Napoleon. Let's just be honest. And Swedish people wanted him to be king, so he became king. Bernadotte enlisted in the French Royal Army, aged 17, and proved a model soldier, rising to become the senior non-commissioned officer in his regiment in just 10 years. The French Revolution and active service opened the door to rapid promotion. He was made an officer, and thanks to exemplary leadership and courage, rose in rank from captain to general of division in a single year. Not even Napoleon rose through the ranks as quickly. He particularly distinguished himself at Fleurus, leading an attack that helped secure Jourdan's famous victory. As a professional soldier and ex-sergeant major, Bernadotte insisted on the highest standards of discipline and conduct from his men. He even fought a duel with his own chief of staff, whom he accused of taking a bribe. In 1797, Bernadotte was transferred to Italy, where he served under Napoleon's command for the first time. By this stage, both men had brilliant reputations, but despite a good first meeting, a clash of styles and jealous rivalry soon emerged between them. What's more, Bernadotte had immediately got on the wrong side of the future Marshal Berthier, Napoleon's chief of staff, by arresting one of his friends for rivalry with Napoleon at the early times. I bet in the end when he was against Napoleon, he was like, you know what, I was waiting for this moment for so long. Insubordination. In 1798, Bernadotte married Napoleon's ex fiance Desiree Clary. Her sister Julie was married to Napoleon's brother, Joseph. Ah, oh, so that's how his uh, family. He married Napoleon's brother's wife's sister. That's a bit stretch, but all right. Meaning Bernadotte was now family. But when Napoleon asked Bernadotte to support his coup of 18 Brumaire, he refused, though he did not actively oppose it. Napoleon suspected Bernadotte of conspiring against him, but the Clary sisters helped to keep the peace. Throughout this period, Bernadotte held key posts as Minister of War in 1799, Commander of the Army of the West in 1800, and Governor of Hanover in 1804, proving highly effective in each role. That year, Napoleon made Bernadotte a Marshal, and he commanded First Corps at the Battle of Austerlitz, playing a relatively minor part in the Emperor's great victory. Nevertheless, he was rewarded with the title Prince of Pontecorvo. But his relationship with Napoleon remained difficult. In 1806, as Napoleon took on Prussia, Bernadotte was blamed for failing to support Marshal Davout at the Battle of Auerstedt, and was nearly court-martialed. Though Bernadotte partly redeemed himself with a vigorous pursuit of the beaten Prussians. Why wasn't he caught muscle? Nearly caught muscle because basically he was family. Uh, Napoleon's nepotism is kind of sometimes really annoying. At most times he puts away his emotions and you know give the title to the people who deserves it, even though they are not at good terms with him. Uh, but sometimes it's just nepotism comes in the way. It just pisses me off. The next year he missed the Battle of Eylau after his orders were intercepted by the Russians, and a gunshot wound to the neck meant he also missed the Battle of Friedland, with command of First Corps passing to General Victor. When war resumed with Austria in 1809, Bernadotte was given command of the 9th Saxon Corps. On the evening of the first day at the gigantic Battle of Wagram, his troops were in heavy fighting with the Austrians, 
but dressed in white, like the Austrians, they came under devastating friendly fire, panicked and routed. The next morning, Bernadotte pulled his men back without orders, and when they later retreated again, he and the Emperor exchanged sharp words on the battlefield. Bernadotte then issued a proclamation to the Saxons, praising their conduct, and outraging Napoleon. See, that's the thing. He was annoying from the start, and now he's even question, questioning his own emperor at the battlefield. Action is sharp words, man. Get in line, man. He's an emperor. What's wrong with you? Only reason he can get away with it, because his family. And he's a distance family. Napoleon's brother's wife's sister, he married her. I mean, that's a distance family. Sometimes I feel like Napoleon and his family values gets in the way too much. Bernadotte was sent in semi-disgrace to the Dutch coast to oversee the defeat of a major British landing at Valkelum. But another triumphant proclamation, effectively publicising the strength of his forces, further infuriated Napoleon. In an unlikely twist of fate in 1810, Swedish politicians invited Bernadotte to become Crown Prince of Sweden. The current king was old and childless, and Bernadotte was a proven general and administrator, member of the French imperial family, and well regarded by Swedish army officers, who remembered his fair treatment of Swedish prisoners three years earlier in Pomeranian. Oh, why him though? I don't understand. What the hell did he do that he deserved that much? I mean, wasn't there anybody else that he could have approached? Why did he approach him to become his successor? I like to think because he is family to Napoleon, that played a part. Because there were lots of great masters at the time with more accomplishment. Why did you reach him? Rainier. Napoleon was at first bemused, remarking that he could think of other marshals who were better qualified, but he did give his assent. Even exactly. when Bernadotte made it clear that as Crown Prince he would pursue Swedish interests. He was true to his word. Three years later, with Napoleon on the ropes after his disastrous invasion of Russia, Crown Prince Bernadotte brought Sweden into the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. With his insider knowledge, he helped the Allies to devise the Trachenberg Plan, a strategy for defeating Napoleon in Germany by avoiding battle with Napoleon himself and targeting only his marshals. In September, Bernadotte defeated former comrades Marshals Udino and Ney at Denevitz. Five weeks later, he played a major role in the great Allied victory at Leipzig. Bernadotte's legacy would prove the most lasting of any of Napoleon's marshals. The royal house of Bernadotte sits on the Swedish throne to this day. Bernadotte was labelled a traitor by Napoleon's supporters, though not by Napoleon himself. He was unquestionably a gifted soldier and administrator. But his personality clash and long-running feud with the Emperor meant he was never a great marshal. Yeah. He was an a-hole, let's be honest, you know, questioning Napoleon in the battlefield, you know, exchanging sharp words to the Emperor, that's just a bit too much, man. And from the start, he, he, he was like a, you know, a competitor to Napoleon or something, since they were young, I guess, before Napoleon became Emperor. I guess in the end, he was, you know, he was waiting for the moment when he can oppose Napoleon, I guess. He jumped at the moment. 17. Marshal Augereau Augereau had, by his own account, an eventful younger life, serving at various times with the French, Russian and Prussian armies, deserting or being kicked out of all three in dubious circumstances. He briefly earned a living in Dresden as a fencing master, with a feared reputation as a duelist. He embraced the French Revolution and joined a volunteer cavalry regiment known as the German Legion, before holding various staff and training roles where his experience in the regular Prussian army proved valuable. 
Promoted to general, Augereau served in the Eastern Pyrenees, where his flair for tactics and bold, decisive action helped win a series of victories over the Spanish. Later serving in Italy under Napoleon, Augereau proved a highly effective divisional commander. The future Emperor's reports were glowing. Strong character, firmness, energy, has the habit of war, liked by his men, and lucky. In 1796, Augereau played a leading role in Napoleon's victories over the Austrians at Castiglione and Arcole. In fact, the painting of Augereau's heroism at Arcole Bridge long predates the more famous version by Vernet, in which Napoleon takes centre stage, and is an even greater work of fiction. Augereau's standing among fellow generals, however, was damaged by an enthusiasm for looting to rival General Brun, while others were irritated by his loud and boastful manner. Augereau was known to be a reliable Republican, and in 1797 Napoleon sent him to Paris to be the military muscle for the coup of 18 Fructidor. This was an army-backed purge of pro-royalist politicians threatening to restore the French monarchy. A brief spell in charge of the Army of the Rhine demonstrated that Augereau was not suited for high command, as his unruly entourage and obsession with plunder caused chaos at headquarters. As a Republican, Augereau initially opposed Napoleon's seizure of political power, but soon sensed which way the wind was blowing and pledged support. Created a marshal in 1804, state of... So he opposed the Napoleon's coup, apparently, okay. ...wealth and declining health served to mellow Augereau's behaviour. He commanded 7th Corps in the 1805 campaign, but was held in reserve and missed the great battles of Ulm and Austerlitz. The following year, he was in the thick of the fighting at Jena, leading 7th Corps against the Prussian southern flank. At Eylau in 1807, Augereau was so ill he had to be strapped to his horse, but led 7th Corps into battle in terrible winter conditions. Ordered to advance, his corps lost its way in a blizzard, was mown down by Russian guns, charged and virtually destroyed. Augereau himself was hit and crushed under his own horse. He returned to France to recover, but was never the same again. His energy... He survived? I thought that was it for him, but he survived. Man, if he had to be tied to his horse, I think it would have been, it would have been good time to retire him at the point, man. ...and seal were gone. During Napoleon's war in Spain, he was sent to replace Saint-Cyr as commander of the Army of Catalonia. He completed the grim seven-month siege of Girona, but was soon replaced by Macdonald for his lacklustre performance. In 1812, Augereau commanded depots and reinforcements in the rear, as the Grande Armée marched to its destruction in Russia. However, at Leipzig, he was briefly back to his best, inspiring his small corps of... So, I guess before Leipzig, he was, he was working in the backgrounds, I guess. Uh, you know, retreat points, and he was securing all that during the Swissel, that horrible invasion of Russia. But tons of people died, nearly half a million of his soldiers died. He was securing the, his, you know, supply line. ...conscripts to fight for several key villages in the south, in the face of relentless Austrian attack. In 1814, Napoleon gave Augereau command of the Army of the Rhone, but he surrendered Lyon without a fight, and on news of Napoleon's abdication, denounced his former emperor as a man who, having sacrificed millions of victims to his cruel ambitions, has not known how to die like a soldier. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, Augereau proclaimed his loyalty once more, but the emperor was not interested. Augereau was stripped of his baton, and died the next year. 
Of course, man. You can't just jump back and forth. First of all, he didn't, he didn't agree to Napoleon's coup, and then like you know what, you know that that is the way the wind is blowing. So I'm gonna agree now. He agreed. In the end, he denounced Napoleon like that. And then when Napoleon Napoleon comes back, he's like, I'm back again. Of course, Napoleon is going like, man, enough of it. You can stay back. He was just going where the wind was blowing. He wasn't much loyal to Napoleon, was he? Sixteen. Marshal de Fèvre. François Le Fèvre was a sergeant with 16 years' service in the elite Garde Française when the French Revolution broke out. When the Guard was disbanded, he became an officer in the Paris National Guard and received the first of many wounds protecting the royal family from an angry mob. Every inch the soldier, the Revolutionary Wars brought Lefebvre opportunity for active command and rapid promotion. In just two years, he rose from captain to general, establishing a reputation as a formidable divisional commander, a good tactician, brave, energetic, and attentive to the needs of his men. His chief of staff, the future Marshal Soult, acknowledged that he learned much from Lefebvre's example. In 1799, Lefebvre commanded the Paris military district. Not much impressed by politicians, when Napoleon asked him to support a coup, he was all for it, declaring, yes, let's throw the lawyers into the river. In 1804, Napoleon made Lefebvre... All right. This is something, obviously hardline military figures like uh, Lefebvre, is, is that how you pronounce it? is gonna be all for the Napoleon's coup because look a French revolution happened all right and after that power was in hands of people but whoever had the power was ex becoming extremely corrupt every single person was so corrupt that people like what the hell is this is this the French revolution so it became easier for Napoleon to create a coup uh, you know so at that time hardline military people like this like enough of this we need more dictatorship emperor type things uh, this french revolution is not working so obviously people like this are going to be all for napoleon's coup he's like yeah napoleon's in the right side same thing happened in you know germany during the you know uh, hitler times uh, things you know government so was so weak uh, recession was happening people were fed up apparently and hitler saw all that and just capitalized on that I'm not saying Hitler and Napoleon are same in that way. I'm saying, you know, situation being too weak, people are being corrupt and people are being fed up. That's the main time where some, uh, you know, figure like Napoleon or Hitler to capitalize on it. Like I can capitalize on this and they can just rally people up. So coup can happen like that. Lefebvre, an honorary marshal. Honorary because Napoleon assumed Lefebvre would prefer a quiet life in the Senate after a decade's active service with the scars to prove it. But he'd underestimated Lefebvre, who pleaded for a frontline role. So the Emperor gave him command of the Imperial Guard Infantry for the Jena campaign. The next year, Lefebvre commanded the Siege of Danzig, inspiring the troops of 10th Corps by leading one counterattack in person. After the successful conclusion of the siege, Napoleon. Of course, he wouldn't just sit back. I mean, he he agreed to Napoleon's coup because he was seeing where he, everything was going to hell. He was hard that military figure, so he's like, you know what? I'm gonna make uh, you know France great, I guess, uh, by beating his enemies. Of course, he wanted to be in front lines. You can see it, it was his personality. Napoleon awarded Lefebvre the title Duke of Danzig. Lefebvre's record as a corps commander was mixed. In Spain, he exasperated Napoleon by twice ignoring orders. But in 1809, when Archduke Charles of Austria launched a sudden attack on Bavaria, Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps was crucial in slowing the enemy advance, until Napoleon arrived to take charge. He was then given the difficult task of suppressing a popular revolt in the Tyrol, led by Andreas Hofer, which he achieved despite some early setbacks. 
For the invasion of Russia, Lefebvre commanded the infantry of the Old Guard. During the retreat from Moscow, the 57-year-old Marshal insisted on marching on foot at the head of the Guard all the way. At the end of the retreat, he was devastated to learn that his son, a 27-year-old general, was among nearly a hundred thousand men who had not survived the march. He had been Lefebvre's last surviving child. Of four. Damn, he was 57 and he survived and his kid was 27, he did not. Hundred thousand. Uh, then Napoleon went into the, you know, invasion with 500,000 people and came back with only 20 or 30,000 left. How is this 100,000 was killed? I guess he's just counting who had died by the weather condition. Most of them died by, you know, I guess hunger or, I don't know, lots of them died in the battle or something like that, who knows. 14. After a year recovering from exhaustion and grief, Lefebvre returned to lead the Old Guard one last time in the defence of France, and was in heavy fighting at Montmiral and Montereau. But in April 1814, he was one of the marshals who confronted Napoleon with the reality of his position, and forced him to abdicate. Lefebvre and his wife, an ex-washerwoman turned duchess, were famous for their lack of airs and graces, for honest, blunt speech, and for always helping out old comrades. When a friend commented on Lefebvre's wealth and titles, the marshal invited him into the courtyard I'll have ten shots at you with a musket at thirty paces, he told him. If I miss, the whole estate is yours. When the friend declined, Lefebvre added, I had a thousand bullets fired at me from closer before I got all this. Lefebvre was... <laughs> That's badass, man. He's, he, he knew that he would decline and he's gonna say that in the end. I got a thousand bullets shot at me and afterwards I got this. So he basically just told him that I deserve all this. God damn. I told you he's a strong military figure. Everything is blunt speaking, obviously confronting Napoleon to abdicate. Uh, you can see that he is, you know, hardcore military figure. That's how his entire personality goes. That's how he is. That's how he behaves too exhausted to take an active role in the Waterloo campaign, though he accepted a role as a senator under Napoleon, which led to a brief period in disgrace when the Bourbons returned. His rank and honours were restored to him a year before his death in 1820. 15. Marshal Mortier Edouard Mortier was from a prosperous middle-class background in northern France. When the French Revolution began in 1789, he volunteered for the National Guard, a new middle-class militia charged with preserving order and defending against counter-revolution. When war broke out with France's neighbours, Mortier's unit was sent to the front. Standing six foot four, Mortier was conspicuous for his height and bravery being wounded twice, and winning praise from his commander, the future Marshal Lefebvre. In 1799, Mortier fought under General Massena's command at the Second Battle of Zurich, helping to defeat the Russians and winning promotion to the rank of General of Division. Mortier then spent three years commanding the Paris military district. His efficiency impressed the new First Consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, who chose him for an important mission in 1803. The occupation of Hanover, a German state belonging to the Hanoverian kings of Britain, with whom France was, once more, at war. Mortier carried out this assignment with tact and diplomacy, ensuring the occupation was unopposed. This delighted Napoleon, who rewarded him a year later with the rank of Marshal. Following Napoleon's victory over the Austrians at Ulm in 1805, Mortier and his new Eighth Corps led the pursuit of the retreating Russians, but became encircled by a much larger force at Durenstein. Mortier fought his way out of the trap with a nighttime bayonet charge, 
a remarkable escape, but his corps suffered heavy losses. Yeah. Mortier and 8th Corps were in a... When he said bayonet charge, I'm like, yeah, he's going to lose lots of people there. ...porting role for the Jena campaign of 1806. But the next year at Friedland, his corps played an important role holding Napoleon's left wing, as the Emperor inflicted a devastating defeat on the Russians. Mortier was well liked by all and almost uniquely did not engage in feuds and rivalries with the other marshals. Oudinot was a particular friend. In East Prussia, their party trick was to snuff out the candles with pistol shots. They always paid generous compensation for damage caused. In 1808, Mortier joined Napoleon for the invasion of Spain, and commanded V Corps at the brutal Siege of Zaragoza. He then helped win a series of victories over Spanish forces, including the crushing victory at Ocaña, operating alongside another friend, Marshal Soult. Mortier was recalled to France to organise and train the Young Guard, a new junior unit of the Imperial Guard, made up of the best conscripts from each year's intake. Mortier led the Young Guard in Russia in 1812, but was powerless to prevent the Corps' destruction on that campaign. First through exhaustion and disease on the march to Moscow, then on the retreat, where his surviving troops were effectively sacrificed to hold open the road at Krasny and allow the army's escape. Yeah, damn, that's just effed up, man. That was a horror show. That, that retreat was a horror show. People, oh my god, look at that pause, look at that face. That was a horror show, man. First of all, Blizzard is here, they are running through, you know, bad conditions, they are low in supplies, that was one of the key points to run away. They didn't have any gear to prepare, and yet people like this, you know, they were standing there to defend the retreating people, knowing that we are likely going to die, and they were still defending. Ugh. That's just heavy, man, seriously. Mortier continued to command the Young Guard during Napoleon's campaigns in Germany and France, and was never far from the action. At Lützen, he was trapped under his wounded horse, was in heavy fighting at Leipzig, and had his hat shot through outside Paris. Damn, yeah, okay. In 1814, the final defence of the French capital fell to troops under Mortier and Marmont, with support from Marshal Monsey's National Guard. Mortier told his men, We have not enough troops to resist their large armies for long, but today, more than ever before, we are fighting for our honour. Yeah, apparently anybody who's under Marshal Mortier is fighting for honour. Because they are, they are always in hopeless situation in Russia or even in here in the defense of Paris. Always fighting a larger army where, you know, they are just fighting for honor and in the end they are going to die apparently. I guess in the Par case of Paris, they were basically, you know, surrendered. But lots of them would have died in the end. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, he wanted Mortier to resume his customary role at the head of the Young Guard but a severe attack of sciatica prevented him joining the Emperor at Waterloo. Napoleon never regarded Mortier as suitable for major independent command, but his loyalty and conduct were always beyond reproach. He went on to serve the restored monarchy as ambassador to Russia and briefly minister for war. In 1835, he was riding beside King Louis-Philippe in a public parade when an assassin opened fire with a homemade, multi-barreled gun. The king received a minor wound, but Marshal Mortier and 17 others were killed. Ah, damn. 14. Marshal Marmont. I was betrayed by Marmont, whom I could call my son, my child, my creation. Vanity was his undoing, Napoleon, okay. Marmont, like Napoleon, was a trained artillery officer and met the future emperor for the first time at the Siege of Toulon, where Napoleon made his name. 
they formed a friendship, and when Napoleon was given command of the French army in Italy, he took Major Marmont with him as an aide-de-camp. Marmont distinguished himself at several of Napoleon's early victories in Italy, and was commanding his own artillery regiment by the age of 23. As part of Napoleon's inner circle, Marmont accompanied him on his expedition to Egypt in 1798, fighting in the battles of Alexandria and the Pyramids. Naturally, he backed Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire, as Napoleon overthrew the Directory and made himself First Consul of France. Six months later, Napoleon led an army over the Alps into Italy. It was his artillery commander, General Marmont, who figured out how to get the cannon through the mountain passes using man-hauled sledges. <laughs> At the ensuing Battle of Marengo, Marmont's skilled handling of the artillery helped Napoleon to win a decisive victory over the Second Coalition. Ah, so when we saw all the Napoleonic wars and how Napoleon's artillery was just right and just damaging the others, I guess he was the, you know, mastermind behind all of that. Two years later, Marmont was made Inspector General of Artillery, working yeah. with Napoleon to implement reforms that improved firepower, mobility and supply. So Marmont is the reason why Napoleon's artillery was so good. And even with less guns, he was dominating everybody. See, that's the thing. Napoleon alone wasn't everything. He made key muscles. They were good at their whatever they were doing, and that made all the difference. So, system of martial corps, that changed a massive deal for Napoleon. That's when Napoleon, even though most of the time Napoleon had the massive numbers compared to the opposing army, there was some times when Napoleon was really outnumbered and yet he still massacred them all. Marmont was bitterly disappointed not to be among the first marshals created in 1804. But he was still only 29, and Napoleon assured him that time was on his side. He was further frustrated in 1805, when his corps was sent to guard the army's strategic southern flank, and so missed the great victory at Austerlitz. The spoils of that war included Dalmatia, which Marmont was sent to govern in 1806. Though he lived in extravagant luxury, his reforms and infrastructure projects were so effective that even the Emperor of Austria later admitted, it's a great pity that Marmont was not in Dalmatia two or three years longer. <laughs> Damn, okay. When war broke out with Austria again in 1809, Marmont marched north with 11th Corps to join Napoleon near Vienna. But at the Great Battle of Wagram, his troops remained in reserve, while the other corps were engaged in ferocious fighting. At last, an opportunity to prove himself came, as Napoleon ordered him to pursue the retreating Austrians. But reckless over-enthusiasm nearly led to disaster at Znaim. A week later... Yeah, it, it's plain obvious. He wanted to become Marcel Dion. He wanted to be part of the Austerlitz victory thing. So, he, he was just in for the fame and glory. That's what all he saw, the, you know, leisures of uh, everything, his leisure of success, uh, you know, fame and glory. That's what he cared about the most. So he was, he was just half-assing things and obviously making mistakes. And Napoleon probably saw that, that he's young and he's too eager. So basically, he kept him back uh, in reserves whenever he could. Later, Napoleon created three new marshals, MacDonald, Oudinot and Marmont. Macdonald for France, it was said, Oudinot for the army, Marmont for friendship. <laughs> Napoleon then rather undermined the moment by telling Marmont, between ourselves, you've not yet done enough to justify my choice. Yeah. His big chance came in 1811, when he was sent to Spain to replace Marshal Massena. But after a promising start, and some bold maneuvering against the British on the Douro River, he stumbled into disaster at Salamanca. Marmont himself was an early casualty of the battle, badly wounded by a shell burst and carried from the field, as Wellington routed his army. After convalescing in France, Marmont was back with the Grande Armée in 1813, 
as Napoleon battled. To so far, I'm seeing that Marmon should have been very low in the in this list. I don't know why he's at this position. He should have been much lower. So far, what I've seen, I, was, I haven't seen much of better victories. I just see disasters and half-assing of things. To save his empire, he commanded Sixth Corps throughout the campaign in Germany, fighting at Lützen, Bautzen, and Dresden. At Leipzig, he held the northern sector with skill and determination, making Blücher's Prussians pay a high price for the village of Mürker. Marmont played an important role in Napoleon's 1814 defence of France, shadowing Blücher's movements along the Marne River and guarding the road to Paris. But by now, he was showing signs of exhaustion and disillusion. Ah, so that's why he's a bit higher in the list, because of Leipzig and defense of France. He was good at that. At the Battle of Long, he allowed his corps to be surprised by the enemy, with heavy loss. Napoleon's stinging criticism may have been the moment that ended Marmont's loyalty. He was the senior marshal in Paris when... Yeah, he wasn't much of loyal anyway. As soon as he became, you know, uh, became at the side, inside of Napoleon, he wanted to become a uh, marshal. And when Napoleon said, you're too young, he's like, no, I want to become marshal. That didn't happen. He wanted to be part of the glorious victories. Not that, you know, do your task, what you've been told. No, I wanted to be at Austerlitz. He's like, he sounds like a brat or something. He was in for, you know, glory, and at the time when, you know, Napoleon said, I only made you marshal because, you know, basically you were annoying me. You haven't done anything to become marshal in my eyes, so he's, he's like, you know what, screw you, Napoleon. So he wasn't much of loyal anyway. He just wanted to, he just wanted all the fame and glory, that's it. When the Allies attacked on the 30th of March, after a day's fighting and facing inevitable defeat, he negotiated the city's surrender. Five days later, with Napoleon at Fontainebleau still planning to march on Paris, Marmont marched his corps over to the Allied lines and surrendered. Napoleon was shocked at this betrayal by one of his oldest comrades. He'd already been persuaded that he must try to abdicate in favour of his three-year-old son. Now he accepted that he must abdicate without conditions. Whether Marmont acted to save lives, out of self-interest or spite, or a combination of all three, remains the subject of heated debate. Yeah, it was basically he wasn't much of loyal, and that kind of played a part. Like he he didn't trust Napoleon in the end. He saw where everything was going, and he thought, you know what, to save me and my my people, I have to you know surrender. So that's what he did. He didn't trust Napoleon much because I don't think he trusts Napoleon ever. He just wanted to be part of fame and glory. We do know that he was well rewarded by the restored Bourbon King and never forgiven by Bonaparte loyalists. As military commander of Paris in 1830, Marmont could not prevent the next revolution and had to flee France. He spent the rest of his life in exile becoming tutor while he was in Vienna to Napoleon's son, the Duke of Reichstadt. He was the last of Napoleon's marshals to die, in Venice, in 1852. Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont. Thirteen down, thirteen to go. Join us for part three, when we'll continue the countdown, coming soon. Yeah. I think the end time when, you know, Mahmoud thought that, you know, he's doing the right thing by surrendering. Maybe, uh, you know, if he hadn't surrendered, Napoleon maybe had a chance. But then again, you could say about any small thing that happened that that could have been the key turning point. But let's, let's be honest, Napoleon was done. He was making bad choices in the end. Biggest bad choice he made was Russian invasion with half-ass preparation. So Napoleon was going down anyway, regardless of what. But yeah, so Marmon was kind of smart in the end to surrender and save his people. But let's be honest, he just did it because he didn't trust Napoleon. So yeah, Bernadotte, his family member, but was kind of annoying. Let's be honest, questioning Napoleon all the time. Others are, you know, was kind of meh. 
uh, Lafavre was more, you know, uh, military minded and more respected, I guess. So yeah, it's just 14, uh, there are 13 more to go. We are not even in top 10 right now. Yeah, this was a good video, man. I, I surprisingly remember some of the events about this. I, I thought, you know, I'm not going to remember none of this, but I do remember it, so that's surprisingly. Uh, I hope I remember more as the numbers grow, you know, closer to top 10, top 5. Because those are going to be the key marshals throughout uh, the, you know, Napoleonic Wars. I think I'm going to remember things about Marshal Dao because he's been my favorite from the start. So yeah. Well, people, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. And check out the other video that I reacted to in the description. It's a playlist of all my videos. Or check out the end cuts. I'll see you next time.